tomorrow. I'm just kind of like, I'm like, across the Yeah. Honestly, I need to help myself because I'm not doing it. Like, I'm just not working at it. I'm just tired. I don't want to. Oh, do not. Not doing one of the practice rounds. Yeah. Don't care. I, am. I don't want to look like an idiot, but I really just want to fail out too. I was trying to get Crystal like turn in a worse so. brief so we could like twenty seven cents. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's cheap, right? Cheaper than a water bottle. I shouldn't put a water bottle out anyways because you don't have like the well, to just not put so much effort into it so that we get a worse one so we fail out of these. Oh, no. Yeah, you said Christmas. Okay. You're talking about
I, that the uh, video supports in advance. And I put my camera right there. It's already running, so I don't feel worried about it. Great. I look for the tripod also. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm able to move virtual. The camera is like 400. Oh. Tripod is free. But I can basically record the brand. And the camera actually has Wi-Fi built into the stream. It's the stream from here. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that's
This is a, a report that came out in January of this year, um, which found the U.S. health disadvantage across income levels compared to other wealthy countries. Um, and we also have a lot of variability around the country. Um, we happen in this region to be in a particularly high quality, low cost area, but there, that's not true around the country. The third problem to be addressed by the law that it has to address is access. The fact that so many millions of people in our country either don't have health insurance or have really lousy health insurance. Um, and this is actually one area that the numbers of people in the U.S. who have health insurance uh, has actually gone up in the past couple of years. Um, and some of the ACA access provisions um, certainly contributed to that. So I just threw up here some of the provisions that have gone into effect so far in the past three years, um, including one of the most popular on campus, um, being able to stay on your parents' plan until the age of 26. Um, another popular one on campus is the preventative care benefit, and that's a uh, requirement within Medicare and increasingly on private insurance to provide preventative care without a copay and without coinsurance. So these are some of the provisions that have gone into effect um, so far, um, what else has happened in the past couple of years that impacts ACA implementation? Well, certainly two very contentious um, elections in which the ACA was a central issue. Um, and part of the contentiousness really is just pure politics. But it's also true that health reform really touches at some core fundamental values that people hold. Um, health care really is personal. People worry about their own ability to get good health care and they worry about their friends and their family, especially where there are serious medical issues or financial concerns. Um, but certainly this contentiousness has made implementation more difficult, um, as has the Supreme Court decision, which effectively made the Medicaid expansion optional. Um, so what's happening this year? These are a few of the provisions that have gone into effect this year. Um, but mostly, this year is about preparing for next year. So some of the most consequential aspects of the Affordable Care Act go into effect January 1st. And these include, um, it'll be illegal to deny somebody health insurance or charge them more or offer them a different policy because of their health status or their expected health status. Um, and this mostly applies on the individual market, but to those to whom it applies, it is extraordinarily um, significant. Um, the individual mandate uh, will go into effect. And this is the requirement that most citizens have insurance through Medicare, Medicaid, an employer, private purchase, or pay a tax to the federal government. And there are some exceptions for religious objection and those for whom the cheapest plan is too expensive. There's also an employer mandate going into effect. And this requires that all employers with more than 50 employees provide adequate, affordable insurance to all their employees who work more than 30 hours a week. And if they don't provide that insurance, they have to pay a tax to the federal government. But they only have to pay this tax if any one of their employees gets subsidized insurance on health insurance exchange. And I'll talk more about these in a minute. But these are one of the two ways the law really attempts to increase the number of people who have coverage. Um, the other is the Medicaid expansion. And the Medicaid expansion, um, which is now an option, allows states to increase coverage on their Medicaid programs to cover every citizen with an income below 138% of the poverty level. So as this chart shows, that mostly means more adults. Because right now, if you're an adult, and you're under age 65, and you're not pregnant, and you're not disabled, you probably are not eligible for Medicaid, no matter how low your income is. So this would allow states to cover those people with initially 100% federal matching dollars. Um, and that ratchets down over a few years to 90% match. And right now, by way of comparison, in Washington State, our match is 50-50. Um, so what are these health insurance exchanges? They're now being called marketplaces, which is a much better term. Um, and they are to be up and running um, and available for people to purchase health insurance starting October of this year. So these will be places 
that people who, um, individuals and families and small businesses who don't have access to other affordable, adequate insurance um, can go to compare private insurance plans. These are all private, no public option. And all the plans have to provide what are called essential health benefits. So the idea is they'll be apples to apples comparable. So the place to go to compare plans, decide which one you want to buy, and probably most significantly, that's the place to go to get subsidies. And this is about the most expensive part of the Affordable Care Act, are these subsidies for people with incomes between 100 and 400% of the poverty level. They get advanceable, refundable tax credits. <coughs> and effectively what that means is the money goes direct from the federal government to whichever insurance company the person bought their plan through. So it's a discount from the purchaser perspective um, and quite generous at the lower income levels. So I just popped these up. This is um, the current federal poverty levels. So a family up to earning $94,000 would be eligible for subsidies. Although at that level, pretty small subsidies. This is Washington's exchange. Um, this is Oregon's exchange, for those of you from Oregon. Um, most states, however, are defaulting to the federal government, which is very unexpected and an implementation challenge. All the yellow states will be run by the federal government. Um, and then we also have overlaying that, making it a really complicated exercise of, federal, of cooperative federalism, um, the Medicaid expansion or not. So this um, map, the blue, if you look at the key, is states that are definitely participating in the Medicaid expansion. So this map is wrong because it's based on what governors said they were going to do. And governors don't control the states. Um, so for example, Florida is bright blue because Governor Scott is almost a 180 and has come out in favor of expanding the Medicaid population. Made a really strong moral case for it. But the legislature went out of session on Friday without expanding. So that state will be red going forward. So in sum, um, uh, where do we come from? Um, there's been progress on some of the key problems the ACA is meant to address as many provisions have gone into effect. Um, where are we right now? Um, I think there's a lot of anxiety about how the incentives will work, how the costs will work, and mostly about all the change that's happened um, and all the change that's coming. You know, a lot of people, a lot more people will have good um, health insurance but a far greater challenge is making sure everybody has quality, affordable health care. So that makes for an exciting time coming up and a worrisome time and a time of a lot of potential. We may have time for comments or questions later, but now let's hear about this really interesting. Thank you so much. Morning, everyone. That's how we're doing. Good? Good. Good. Awesome. Uh, thank you to Sean and our resident health expert and everyone here for coming to attend my talk. Uh, I am very, very excited. So how many of you study this case in con law? How many of you studied this case in con law last year? Say everyone, right? So if I were to ask, the year is 2009 when I graduated law school. If I were to ask all of you, would it be constitutional for Congress to regulate a massive market that affects millions and millions of people by saying you have to have insurance? The answer would have been, of course. Every single person in here would have said, of course, if you wrote an answer that this was unconstitutional, Professor Collins would have failed you, or at least given you a very interesting remark in your exam. Fast forward to 2012. <clears throat> Five justices of the US Supreme Court hold that the individual mandate, which he mentioned forced you to buy insurance, is unconstitutional. What happened in these three years? This is an amazing story of the Constitution. It begins with the president, who had this noble vision of reforming health care. Uh, in 2009, at the, at the uh, inauguration, he had a series of priorities. But he made his top priority for year one, health care. That's what he wanted to do. It's a story of Congress riding on the wave of the president's uh, inaugural victories. We had a vast majority of Democrats in Congress who said, we're going to pass this. We are going to change health care. And it's a story of the Supreme Court. When this case first began, Few anticipated would ever make it to the court, but ultimately it's about the Constitution and how the Constitution reacts and responds, perhaps even livingly, to what is going on in the political realm. 
I won't talk much about the politics, I'm sorry, the economics of healthcare, because she did such a wonderful job, but it's expensive. This has been an ongoing problem in our country for many, many years. How do we handle exploding cost of healthcare? So some of you might remember this picture, right? Uh, if any of you are young enough, this was uh, uh, First Lady Clinton back in the early 90s who had the idea to have this massive health care reform. And you might remember this commercial. It was, the, uh, it was the Bob and Louise commercial running on TV saying, you know, if we have the government take over health care, we'll be in very bad shape. That failed. But this brings us forward to 2009 when President Obama was inaugurated. Actually, it happened here because the first time the Chief Justice messed up the oath. So this was the, <laughs> the actual inauguration take two. Uh, random bit which you might not know, President Obama and Roosevelt share one honor. They're the only presidents to take the presidential oath four times. Obama took it once here, and they messed up the oath, twice afterwards. This year, in 2013, the uh, January 20th fell on a Sunday, and the Constitution says you have to be sworn in on the 20th. So he had one swearing in in private, and another swearing in at the Capitol. So he's had the four, four oaths of office. But we have this new presidency, this, this hope and change, and we have this Affordable Care Act. When this law was first being drafted, the Constitution wasn't really even a factor. Um, indeed, the entire idea of the individual mandate was a conservative idea. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative think tank in Washington, said, listen, the way we cut down costs, the way we prevent people from you know, going to the emergency room and not buying insurance without having a mandate, we force people to buy insurance. If they don't buy insurance, no problem. You have to pay a penalty. And the money from that penalty will then be taken to fund other people's insurance. It was actually it's a good idea. Uh, if people aren't using a service and they need to use it otherwise, you make them pay for it. But in early 2009, something started to happen. There was this group that kind of bubbled out of nowhere, the Tea Party. They sprung up with this massive opposition to the federal government, President Obama in particular. And one of their rallying cries was Obamacare. They wanted to stop it. They had this loose, popular constitutional vision where you know, the, the, the nature of the Constitution reflected this kind of a ideal of what the relationship was between the federal government and the states. But this movement bloomed and blossomed, and it started to have a pull on Congress. They started marching outside and protesting. And before you know it, this law, which probably enjoyed massive support in 2009, began, began to be very unpopular. Even as Congress was deliberating on this very bill, you had 40,000 Tea Partiers to Senate Washington saying that this should not happen. But then we go to legislative battle. The fight over Obamacare in Congress was very, very tight. It shouldn't have been. The Democrats had 61 votes in the Senate. They could break any filibuster. They held ranks. They had, I think, a, third, I think like a 50 or 70 vote uh, a lead in the House. They could vote this entire law in without a single Republican vote. They could do it. No one thought they would have to. But over the summer, as the Tea Party started growing, and as the sense that we can really give uh, President Obama you know, a, a, a huge defeat on this, the opposition grew. So Harry Reid had to be very deft in passing it. This was a bill, actually, by the way. Does anyone know how many pages the Affordable Care Act is? Don't answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. 2,100. I think it was closer to 27, but, but yes. 2,700 pages, right? This bill was more or less drafted in secret. Uh, it was only released to be voted on about two weeks before the final vote. A Christmas Eve vote was slated. And I love this cartoon uh, because really no one read the bill. And uh, Speaker Pelosi famously said, you know, you're going to have to you're gonna have to pass the bill to find out what's inside of it. Uh, we're learning that right now because there's a lot of stuff we don't know. But in order to get the bill through, even though we had a 61 vote majority, Harry Reid had to buy people off in the Senate. There's no other way of looking at it. So who here remembers the court cluster kickback? Remember that? So Senator Ben Nelson, a moderate Democrat of Nebraska, needed extra money, basically, to pay off Nebraska's Medicaid expansion. There was also the Louisiana Purchase, where Senator Mary Landry of Louisiana got extra money. So basically, Harry Reid needed to buy off these two senators to get their votes, but he got them. This will become important in a minute. So with, with these bought off votes, no problem. But an issue arose. Senator Ken Kennedy passed away. This guy, Scott Brown, took his seat in the Senate. This was huge. Because the Democrats no longer had 61 votes, Republicans had killed us with a filibuster. Scott Brown's special election was about two weeks after they had the Christmas Eve vote. So the Democrats had a problem. They voted on this bill with all this other crap, this appointments or kickback, who's done a purchase, they voted on this bill. 
had to then go to the, the House. But the problem was the House wouldn't vote on this bill. So what were they going to do? They had to find a way to allow the House to change the bill without sending it back to the Senate. Once the bill was sent back to the Senate, all game over, filibuster. They could not do anything. So it fell to the master of the house, keeper of the zoo, Nancy Pelosi. And she had the unenviable task of passing a bill that the Senate never passed. And John Boehner, the Republican leader, who was to become speaker of the house, he had to fight against this. So Boehner tried to have the opposition to this, and here's my obligatory Obama and Snooki picture, lest we forget the Snooki tax. But Pelosi had the enviable tax. Oh, Snooki tax. There's actually an excise tax to go to a tanning salon. This was a Jersey Shore tax. I, I see lots of pale faces in the room, but where I come from in Staten Island, uh, uh, it's a very common uh, pastime where you go tanning. There's a, now there's an excise tax on that. I have to always leave this in. I fought my publisher to leave in a paragraph with the Snooki tax, and I got it, and so I was very happy. But anyway, Pelosi had an unenviable task of passing a version of the Affordable Care Act that all the other garbage in it. So they did this really weird procedural mechanism. So there's a process called reconciliation, which basically means that there's small differences between the Senate bill and the House bill. The House can kind of change it, and the Senate will vote on their modified bill without the 60 vote requirement for filibuster. But what Pelosi did was she took the entire 2,700 page bill, all 2,700 pages, crossed out all of it, and added a new 2,700 pages without those provisions. She basically rewrote the entire Senate bill and was going to have the House vote on that. And that way, you could avoid the filibuster. Scott Brown, who ran in the 41st vote, couldn't stop it. So we had the House vote. The numbers here are staggering. Mind you, not a single Republican in the Senate voted for it. Look at these numbers. 219 yay, 210 no. You had 34 Democrats cross the aisle to vote against this law. Think about it. 49% of Congress opposed this law. 49% of Congress opposed this law. There's no surprise that there's been so much opposition. This has been opposed from the beginning. I actually went back and did the math. I looked at the Social Security Act, uh, uh, the Act that created Medicaid, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Civil Rights Act. Never before has a piece of landmark legislation been passed with no bipartisan support. Never. Andrew Johnson got more former segregationists to vote for the Civil Rights Act that Obama got to vote for the Affordable Care Act. That's staggering. The president made the resolution to pass this no matter what. He said, this is my legacy. That's how he defined it. He needed to do it now or never. Everyone told him, don't do this now. Biden told him, you need 50% of the Democrats. Biden told him that. Larry Summers, Peter Orzag, everyone in his cabinet said, don't do this now. Don't do this in a straight party line vote. We're going to have serious problems. And a lot of the implementation problems we have now are a direct byproduct of that. There's been no cooperation on this on any level because it began in such acrimony. But in any event, it passed. We have this beautiful signing statement in the ceremony. If you look here, the president has 21 different pens. These are commemorative pens where he signs a little bit of a signature for each pen. He waves souvenirs. Um, so he signed this bill. He's smiling. He said, the time for debate is over. This was March 23, 2009. He could not be more wrong. The time for battle is about to begin because of the Constitution. In the preceding months, starting in November of 2009, a number of law professors, many in the federal side, started to debate about why this law might be unconstitutional. I give you a little bit of a vignette. So has anyone ever been to the federal side convention in Washington, the National Lawyers Convention? Okay. So I was there in 2009. I had just finished law school. And I was just kind of wandering around, you know, just shooting the breeze with people. And I walked up to a group of lawyers. And they were saying, you know, we got just about this, this law, this health care law. And I was like, what do you mean? This is constitutional. It's commerce. But you know, there, there's nothing wrong with this. This is this massive economic boom, right? How can this not be constitutional? And one lawyer, his name was Todd Gaziano, he said, no, this is different. This is, this is forcing people to engage in commerce. He said, you know, could, could Congress force you to buy gym membership? This was the broccoli argument much earlier on. And I was like, well, I don't know. I never thought about that. And then who walks in but Randy Barnett, uh, the, the, the godfather of the ACA challenge. And, and Todd goes to Randy, hey, let's do something about this. And Randy says, I quote, by the way, you wrote the forward for my book, so he knows this. I'm saying this. He said, I quote, I haven't given it much thought. Randy, top libertarian lawyer, hadn't given much thought to this challenge back in November 2009. But in the few weeks after that, Randy and Todd prepared an entire memo saying that this was unconstitutional. 
What's the argument? That never before had Congress compelled people to engage in commerce. That this was indeed unprecedented. There was no precedent to support it. So what are relevant precedents? We have, of course, this is uh, Roscoe Filburn, Farmer Filburn, if you remember the wheat case. And this is Claude Wicker. I love this picture because he was the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. And the picture has all these graphs and, and, uh, and diagrams showing agricultural forecasts, which are probably all wrong. Uh, but we have this case, Wicker versus Filburn. The Supreme Court says, as I'm sure you all know, wheat grown on one farm. Even if it never leaves the farm, it still has a substantial effect in interstate commerce. The Commerce Clause is broad. Fast forward to 2003, this is Angel Raich uh, from Gonzales v. Raich. You might not have seen her looking like this, but she has very advanced cancer. And I ask this always, who knows what this thing is? Volcano. Not a volcano. <laughs> yes. See, I, I gave this same talk in Texas, no one's willing to admit it. But we're in Washington, it's all cool. It's a marijuana vaporizer. <laughs> this is a way that she inhales marijuana. Marijuana should grow on her own farm, the seats never left. Thank you, sir, for, for being brave. So she argued that, hey, listen, this is pot that never leaves my farm, right? There's no market for marijuana. How can this be commerce? She was represented by none other than Randy Barnett. By the way, small footnote, Randy faced off against Paul Clement in Gonzalez versus British. They later became better friends in this case. Randy lost. Supreme Court, 6-3, with Kennedy and Scalia both majority said, no. This still has an effect on, you know, interstate commerce, whatever. And Scalia had a concurrence saying that, you know, this necessary and proper power is very broad. So, you know, everyone thought this was a ball game. You know, if you ask any law professor in 2009, if I asked Professor Collins, or if you asked me, I would have said, Raish, done deal. Ball game over. Right, Professor Collins? He's nodding. <laughs> but, something else happened. Can the government make you buy broccoli? Why broccoli? I, I've actually tracked down the origin of this. It wasn't originally as broccoli, it was actually asparagus. Judge, uh, Judge, uh, what's his face, uh, in, uh, in Virginia, Judge Hudson said, could Congress make you buy asparagus? And that kind of took off and it became broccoli. I guess, I, I don't like asparagus either, so I guess it would have worked. But this notion of the government making you buy broccoli is just so powerful. Uh, I, I traced it back to President George H.W. Bush, who said, you know what, I'm president now. You know, I'm a grown-up. You're not going to have broccoli in Air Force One. He actually banned it in Air Force One. So, you know what, can people be, uh, force you broccoli? And Stewie. You know, there's another clip from The Simpsons. Can you fork complete broccoli? <laughs> Even more so, this is a better example. Can Congress force you to buy a car? Not make you buy a car in the abstract, but say if you're buying a new car, you have to buy an American car made in Detroit because Detroit's bankrupt. Can Congress do this? These ideas, excuse me, start to percolate and, and germinate. And in a very quick time, really in the span of months, the entire constitutional narrative changed. It evolved. So let's go back to the law. You can see here uh, the jagged breaks in the signature. That's because he used all 21 different pens. Uh, he just like a little bit of time. It's actually very difficult, apparently. So March 23rd, 2010, boom, law. What do you think the first thing that happens after these lawsuits are filed? Race to the court. And I need a race. So after Barnett and others had written that report, a number of lawyers had come together to try and get these complaints ready to file at the moment the law was enacted. So there were two main suits. The, main, the first suit was actually in Florida, where a lawyer named David Rifkin and Lee Casey, who were both uh, former Reagan officials, came together and worked with the attorneys in Florida. It was a consortium of about 12 states at first. And they said, listen, we have to challenge this law as unconstitutional. The other main suit was from Virginia. This is Attorney General Kim Cuccinelli, uh, who is actually running for governor now. Cuccinelli fractured off, and he said, I'm going to have my own suit. I'm going to bring my own case. So you all know what supremacy clause is, right? Any state law that's in conflict with the federal law, the federal law wins, right? Virginia passed something called the Virginia Healthcare Freedom Act, which basically said that it would violate Virginia law to enforce the mandate. In other words, no citizen of Virginia can be forced to buy insurance. This thing was so unconstitutional, it's funny. But Cuccinelli said, this is our thing, this is our nullification ticket. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the Supreme Court uh, reporters commented to me that uh, on the anniversary of Virginia's uh, session for the Union, you had the Attorney General of the Old Dominion arguing that federal law doesn't apply. And I think the Virginia Democratic Party said it's like good old Dixie days. Uh, this suit was doomed. Yet somehow, he won. 
and the president wasn't happy. Judge Hudson in Virginia actually ruled in favor of Puccinelli, and this was the first blow. But the real deal, the main event, was in Florida from this guy, Judge Roger Vincent. Or I'm sorry, Fred. yeah, Roger Vincent, not Fred. He's the justice. The case in Florida is much more sophisticated. They made the important decision to add private plaintiffs. So in addition to merely having all the states challenging this law as unconstitutional, they had private plaintiffs saying, listen, I don't want to buy insurance. This affects my you know, income. I don't want it to do it. Judge Vinson, in what I recommend you read, is actually one of the better opinions of the entire case. It's very easy to read. Ruled that the entire Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. All of it. This was big. Because now you had a split. Initially, many said this was never going to the Supreme Court. I was one of those people. I was wrong. Once Obama lost this case, we're off to the races. This is going to the Supreme Court. But let's talk a little bit about strategy now. So this is Neil Katyal. He was the deputy SG, deputy solicitor general. Who was the solicitor general at this time? Someone named Elena Kagan. You, you've probably heard of her. But she had nothing to do with this case. The most important case of the federal government in probably 15 years, and the solicitor general said, eh, not me. Why? Because she wanted to be in the Supreme Court. So I've actually gone through all the emails, these were all FOIA, all the emails, and there's this one hilarious email where Neil Katyal sends Kagan an email saying, hey, this law is we passed him. We're going to have this big case. We're going to have a meeting with everyone in DOJ. Do you want to come? What does Kagan reply? Sure, I'll be there. Oh, I can't wait. What does she reply? What's your phone number? She didn't say call me maybe, but she may well have. It's like, what's your phone number? Let's not create a paper trail for this one. Another email. Cocktail says, we should go to this meeting. And she replies, you should do it. She knew she was going to the Supreme Court. So she distanced herself. So she effectively abdicated the case to this guy, which wasn't necessarily a bad decision. He argued Hamdi, Hamdan, very, very, very bright guy. In the courts of appeals, he's only going against this guy, Republican super lawyer Paul Clement, who might actually be part mortal, part superhuman, we're not sure. But he is the greatest advocate of our generation. He is superlative. So here the arguments had to take form. The main issue of why this law was unconstitutional was because it was called a lack of a limiting principle. If Congress can compel you to engage in commerce, what else can it do, right? If they can make you buy insurance, they can make you buy broccoli. This was the hardest question to answer from the government's perspective. They never actually answered it because there was no answer. So the argument that Cocktail made was that Congress has broad powers under the Necessary and Proper Clause. If there's some sort of national problem that has massive cost shifting, that is, if people are getting health insurance but not paying for it and it creates all this cost shifting to other people, Congress can step in and fix this free, this, uh, free sharing problem. Paul Clement replies saying that's silly. That's not a limiting principle. All that proves is that whenever there's a big problem, Congress can solve it. That doesn't solve anything. Okay, so we, we go to the Courts of Appeals. The first court, which is at the Sixth Circuit, based in Cincinnati. Um, I clerked there, but I, was, I didn't start clerking until this case was decided. Sixth Circuit ruled in favor of the government. And one of the more important votes for this guy, Judge Jeff Sutton, who is a federal slightly stalwart uh, of uh, George Bush appointee, George Bush appointee uh, brilliant guy, he basically took the odd argument that the, the uh, challengers lack standing to uh, confront this, that uh, because this law might be constitutional applied to some people, but not others, we're going to just save it. He found a way to duck the issue. This reveals a splinter among conservative judges where we have the, I'll call it the Clarence Thomas model, who wants to reverse most of the 20th century, and then you have the Jeff Sutton model, who is more willing to be Burkean, be restrained, maybe in the, in the Robert Bork school of thought, if, if you will. So there's this, there's this splinter, this fragment, of how Republican judges operate, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But I'm sure the president was a dude. This is my happy Obama picture. So whenever he wins, this is my, uh, got to flash this one up. So next, we have the 11th Circuit in Atlanta. This was a potential tricky one because there were two Democrats in the panel, and you know, two Ds means they lose. Amazingly, the 11th Circuit actually ruled in favor of the challengers. They found that Obamacare, the mandate is unconstitutional, that Congress lacked the power to compel people into commerce. This was huge, because now we had a circuit split. Once you have a circuit split, the court has to take it. They couldn't duck it. Next we had, yeah, this is my Obama's not happy picture. He's like, stop. Next, we had the Fourth Circuit in Richmond, Virginia. It was in this case that the Fourth Circuit basically bench slapped and Cuccinelli saying, you can't do this. 
your silly, federal, your silly law is preempted, and they even say this is an attempt to nullify federal law. I mean, Cuccinelli's suit was never going off the ground, so happy Obama. But after the summer when these cases were being decided, we had a new SG. So Neil Cocktail was passed over to the Solicitor General twice, once in favor of Elena Kagan, second time in favor of this guy. His name's Donald Really. He was a former partner of Jenner and Block. He uh, he'd argue a lot of the big cases. A really, really smart guy, but very, very nice all as well. He came in, and with his office, he had a different view of the strategy. <coughs> After he came to power in the office, it was a change. All this time, the government argued that Commerce Clause, Commerce Clause, that this is okay under the Commerce Clause. The tax and power argument raised, that, that is, that's a valid tax, but it kind of been held in the back. It wasn't really advanced strongly. He wanted to change that. He was convinced that the way to win this case was with the taxing power. And the next case gave him the proof for that. So the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, they drew an all-star panel. You had Brett Kavanaugh. You had, uh, 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 what's his name, um, Lawrence Silverman. You had the Heller opinion in the, in the Court of Appeals. Uh, you had Harry Edwards, who's a, you know, a brilliant Carter appointment. So you had, you had this all-star panel. All three judges ruled in favor of the government. But Kavanaugh had a very unique opinion. It was based on the tax code. Now, we have this obscure tax opinion. I won't bother walking through it. But there was one sentence, one sentence in Kavanaugh's opinion that changed the fate of this case. Kavanaugh said, you know, we keep talking about this mandate forcing us to buy insurance. But what if it was slightly different? What if instead of forcing people to buy insurance, we merely tax them for not having insurance? Kavanaugh said, if this was rewritten, if Congress wrote it slightly differently, changing three words, instead of making you buy insurance, we're going to just tax you for not having insurance. It would be constitutional. The Solicitor General saw this sentence in the opinion and said, holy cow, this is how we win the case. So Obama was happy. He lost. He won there. He, he won in, in the DC Circuit. So now the score is three to one. Off the Supreme Court, they had to take it. They couldn't avoid it. The court, Obama, they were going to clash. This was going to be one of the most significant constitutional clashes of a generation. Here they're all smiling, but things would not be smiling for much longer. The relationship between these two men is fascinating. Both Harvard Law grads, they both reached the pinnacles of their respective careers, um, and they're both brilliant beyond anything. But they don't always get along, and they haven't. And of late, this guy didn't do much to help it. So who here knows what I'm referring to here? Everyone knows this picture? Yeah, let's try this one. This one might be a little bit easier. <laughs> I had to work like one animated GIF into the talk. So in the 2000 and, um, sorry, 10 State of the Union, mind you, this was January of 2010, about three weeks after the ACA was passed, that in context. Citizens United was decided. This was the big campaign finance brouhaha. President Obama said that this case reverses a century of precedent, right? And it opens the floodgates to foreigners funding elections. And then Justice Alito, who obviously forgot that there were cameras in the roof, <laughs> well, he didn't actually wag his finger like this, but he shook his head like, not true, not true. This is important. We have a sitting president at the State of the Union criticizing the Supreme Court justices who are sitting right there. I went back and checked, and I could not find anyone has done this since Franklin Roosevelt. The last time he was criticized in the Supreme Court, it didn't turn out too well. We had a huge constitutional crisis, and it was a court packing plan. The president has, has actually shown for a law professor, a con law professor, a surprising disregard for the courts. Uh, the way he uh, talked about the Supreme Court here, he made some remarks at the ACA case, or I'll revisit. Um, even his drone policy, the notion that, and Ryan will attest to this, the notion that, judicial pro that due process doesn't mean judicial process. <coughs> He said, surprising aspect of the courts, uh, especially as a common law professor. But anyway, let's not dwell there. So has anyone ever actually camped out at the Supreme Court? I have, three times. It's annoying. The only way to get tickets <laughs> to the Supreme Court is by sleeping outside. So for McDonald v. Chicago, this was a big gun, a Second Amendment case a few years ago. Uh, I, I think I got there 7 p.m. the night before I just slept outside. March in Washington is cold. It is very cold. And what makes it even worse, 
is a sprinkler. <laughs> Every night at 3 a.m., the Supreme Court sprinklers come on. It's like your wake-up call. It's like, hey, you're suffering outside. Surprise, it's cold. The only bathroom is actually Union Station, which is about a half-mile walk. It's not close, and it's freezing. A Starbucks opens up around 7 a.m. Other than that, there's no food in the area. So you're stuck. But the big day arrived. There were going to be four separate arguments, but I'll take you through one at a time. The inside of the court, of course, there are no cameras. So the only way we can know what's going on is by watching C-SPAN. Um, I wasn't there, unfortunately, but I've had the, uh, uh, the great joy of reading every single transcript in this case and every single brief. I read you know, everything. So I'm going to summarize it real quick for you. So at the Supreme Court, there was a change of strategy. Really, basically jettisoned the strategy that Neil Cocktail had. He said, this is not going to work. Why? Because it was, quote, too capacious, right? The strategy that any national problem that gives the government the right to enact this law is too broad. It would not convince the justices. In other words, the reason why Cocktail could not answer the broccoli question was because it didn't actually answer the broccoli <coughs> question. His principle would certainly allow the broccoli law. Rurley really said, nuh-uh, that's not going to work. We can't do that. So he changed the strategy. He basically adopted the very thing that Brett Kavanaugh wrote. The Affordable Care Act and its mandate, which we've been arguing for three years, is not actually a mandate. Let me say that again. There is no mandate in the Affordable Care Act. It is simply a tax on people who fail to buy insurance. Now, this would be foreign to anyone who studied health law for 25 years or longer. This was always a compulsion, a legal mandate to buy insurance. And he says, no, no, no. That's not how it works. But the only way that that argument works is if there are no collateral consequences for failing to buy insurance. So usually, if there's a law saying that you have to do X, if you fail to do X, you've broken the law. You're a lawbreaker. You know, if it says that you have to file a certain form every year and you fail to do that, you're a lawbreaker. The DOJ can prosecute you for fraud, right? This was different. The Solicitor General had to negotiate within the federal government to get a representation. What was this representation? That there are no collateral consequences for failing to have insurance. So say that you're on supervised release or probation, right? And you have to tell your probation officer, have you committed any crimes in the last year, right? If you tell them, I have not purchased insurance, that's not a crime. That key representation, which was important, because it basically said, there's no mandate. There's only the tax. All you have to do is pay the tax. Once that representation was made, it was off to the races. This was so subtle, no one picked up on it. It took a Lawrence drive. He, he got it. No one else did. But before it really could deal with commerce, he had to deal with water. <laughs> so. Immediately after Verley started, within 30 seconds of his argument, he started choking, not choking, gagging. He couldn't breathe. He actually paused for eight seconds to get a glass of water. I, I found out that he had actually done, okay, so the Solicitor General's policy is to do two moots for each case. He had three cases, so a total six moots. In the week before he had done six moot court, his voice was shot. So he took a glass of water before he got to the podium. Once had the wrong pipe. The guy was choking for eight seconds at the Supreme Court on the, on the biggest argument of his life. But that just serves as a template. Because everyone kept saying that the guy's choking. He choked. He messed up the argument. The reason why people said he was messing up the argument was that the justices kept asking him, what is your limiting principle? What is your limiting principle? And he refused to answer the question. He refused. He kept dancing around it. Now, at the time, a lot of people took it to mean that the guy had no skills. He was bad. He was terrible. He had no argument. But it was intentional. Make the mistake. If you ever watched Muhammad Ali back in the old days, remember the rope dope strategy? Where you just let someone punch you, punch you, and punch you, and then find them they tie you right and knock them? It's just no different. Really knew the second that he gave a limiting principle, he would lose. Because no limiting principle would solve this question. As long as the justices are putting the burden on the government, what's your limiting principle? The government loses. And he knew that. So he gave a long, meander answer. So Alito asked succinctly, he said succinctly, what's your limiting principle? He gave this long, meandering answer that made no sense. 
You want to know what? It was almost verbatim from his brief. Read it. Verbatim. He almost had it memorized to a T. He read exactly what was in his brief. It was his strategy not to give that principle, because he knew he was going to lose. He saw Cocktail lose below. He wasn't going to make the same mistake. So for all the people who said that were really messed up, they weren't paying attention. Um, I thought he messed up, and then I went back and rewrote everything. And, and I they talked to people in DOJ, and it's, it's clear that he knew exactly what he was doing. Anyone who was listening? John Roberts. The, the very representation that really made that there are no criminal consequences for failing to buy insurance allowed John Roberts to rule in his favor. In fact, in Roberts' opinion, he cites the transcript, that exact sentence. He cites that exact sentence in the transcript of his opinion of how he justifies it. That did a good job. Paul Clement did an exemplary job as well. Uh, his brief, if you want to see the highest form of advocacy, read his mandate brief. It was brilliant. Uh, Sean and I were talking about it last night. It's just superlative. Uh, one former DOJ lawyer told me it was, quote, written in the voice of Anthony Kennedy. It's just, it was just, it was perfect. So the Supreme Court, they have this case. They come back again and argue at the mandate in day two. And it just doesn't look good. Verrilli's really dancing around the issue, refuses to give principle, but he was just following the script. And Clement was pounding it home. And soon enough, Nino had to have some fun, right? Nino always has fun. And he says, can Congress make you buy broccoli? Or, you know, can they make you buy broccoli? You know, has to ask that question. And, and of course, really just kind of smirks, this smart ass. But, you know, that, that's clear. He, he always, it's Nino being Nino. And they even asked, can, you, can, can Congress make you buy a GM vehicle? Right? No good answer. But then came the interesting day. The Medicaid issue, which, which she alluded to before. This was considered a sleeper issue. Everyone was worried about the mandate, the mandate, the mandate. What about Medicaid? This law effectively forces states to expand the number of people covered by Medicaid. For the first number of years, the feds pay for it, and afterwards, that amount decreases. A number of the states opposed it. They, they said, this is going to bankrupt us. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But the issue was, if a state refuses to accept these new people who are on the Medicaid roll, what happens to their old funding, right? In 2009, Jan Brewer, the Tea Party governor of Arizona, wrote a letter to the HHS, Health and Human Services, in which she asked, if I opt out of this one program, what happens to the rest of my Medicaid funding? Do you want what the letter said? You lose it all. Gone. Gunish. Put. This letter was a position of the federal government that if you do not take this new funding, you lose all of your money. All of it. For the next three years, the government tried to back away from this letter. Because they knew that this letter was accurate, they lost. So the Swissler Journal tried to get people in health and human services to say that this wasn't correct. They wanted to back away from that position. Sibelius so wouldn't do it. She refused to give up this power. Sibelius so would not give it up. And because she wouldn't give it up, they knew they were going to lose this case. Because even during arguments, Breyer and Kagan kept asking really, what about this Arizona letter? Tell us, what authority does the government have? And really said, it's about my pay grade. He wasn't being facetious. As a government lawyer, you don't have the power to make these arguments. He was limited with the arguments he could make. Clement nailed it. He said that this is unconstitutional. So arguments are over. All eyes were on this man, Anthony Kennedy, who's you know, the, the swing justice in the center of the universe and the, you know, the, 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 the brilliant powers of uh, uh, implicit in the concept of order, liberty, whatever. But the eyes should be on this guy with the steely blue eyes, John G. Roberts. Everyone should be looking at him. I love this picture. He's like, who, me? No, not me. This is from his confirmation, I think. So this is the part where Washington becomes accessible. It's a disgusting place. Oh, not your state. I'm sorry, DC. You guys have a beautiful state. I've, I've appreciated my time here. Uh, it's gorgeous. But the other Washington, I actually love on your, on your highway signs is a silhouette of Washington for the highway signs. I love that. It's a classic. So, I like the nerd. So, Washington's accessible. We all know about the leak, right? The leak that, that Jan Crawford wrote saying that the, uh, uh, you know, that the president, I'm sorry, that, that Chief Justice Roberts uh, changed his mind. And that leak was published in July. But that was known much, much earlier. People knew that in May. As early as May, information was leaked from the court telling people that the Chief Justice was getting, quote, wobbly, wobbly. He was changing his mind. 
Many in Washington responded to this. George Will, Kathleen Parker, others actually wrote a string of articles in May of 2012 saying, Chief Justice Roberts grows fine. They weren't just giving their opinion. They were acting on intelligence. They knew what was going on. A proxy war was waged outside the US Supreme Court, trying to bring the Chief Justice back into the fold. This is remarkable. Remarkable. President Obama even got in the action. The president said that it will be, quote, unprecedented, the title of my book, unprecedented for the Chief Justice to strike down this law. So the unprecedented for the court to strike it down. He said, this is Lochner. Uh, Pat Leahy in the Senate said that John Roberts was the Chief Justice we all wanted to be. You had an entire war being waged outside of the court with all three branches. Jerry Smith, the federal judge in Houston, remember this? He actually challenged a DOJ lawyer in a random case saying, do, do the courts have the power of judicial review? Your president said we don't have this power. Do we have this power? Judge Smith ordered Eric Holder, the attorney general, to write a two-page memo, said two pages, certifying the courts retain this power. This scared the crap out of me. I saw all three branches of government were fighting. The president, Congress, now the courts. And in my mind, I was going, oh my god, this is a preview of terrible things to come if they strike down this law. I was really concerned, because I didn't trust any of these people. They were all slinging stuff they had no idea what they were doing. These are deep issues. So, what happens? It falls to this man. We probably won't know exactly what motivated him to do what he did for quite some time. We know what he did. He accepted the argument of the Solicitor General. He said that this violates the Commerce Clause. But, but, for purposes of the constitutionality, I will construe it as a tax because there's no collateral consequences. So it's a tax. There's no crime. We had a vigorous joint dissent from Justice Scalia and Kennedy, where they jointly wrote, along with Thomas and Alito, that this entire law is unconstitutional. We had Clarence Thomas repeatedly refrain that the 20th century is also not constitutional. He's like, nah, whatever. <laughs> Interestingly, Kagan and Breyer joined the Medicaid opinion. Compromise, who knows? But they agreed that Congress can't withdraw all funding for Medicaid. So it's Mayor and Ginsburg. They alone said that the, uh, uh, this entire thing is constitutional. The aftermath of this was a circus. Initially, because of course, no cameras, CNN reported that the mandate was struck down. Uh, uh, you might think that's funny, except for the fact that Obama was watching CNN. So for about 15 minutes, the president thought that his law was unconstitutional. Fox joined in the chorus, uh, saying that the law is unconstitutional. But eventually, he found the law is good. We had a Dewey defeats Truman moment, uh, you know. But ultimately, really, I think it was vindicated. The Chief Justice got a lot of flack. He got ripped apart in the right wing. Uh, Glenn Beck called him a coward. Uh, what's his name? Mitt something, right? I forgot. Anyway, so Romney, is it this guy, right? He made his entire campaign to repeal Obamacare. The only problem was he had instituted it in Massachusetts. Years earlier, he basically imposed the same law in Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, so once Romney was done, this entire issue was gone. But then we had this inauguration. This is actually the third inauguration. And I think we have this interesting dynamics between Roberts and Obama. Uh, there was this interesting moment at the inauguration where uh, Obama was being sworn in, he kind of went to the uh, lectern, he looked at it and said, you know what, let me have one more look, I won't be here again. But Roberts will. Roberts will be the Chief Justice for the next 40 years. And there's some big issues. Affirmative action, gay marriage, same, uh, 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 you know, voting rights. By saving this law, he actually preserved the court for the future and gave it the institutional power to continue. So ultimately, Roberts and Obama, they'll continue to face off maybe in another month or so and the Constitution will be here. And thank you for your time. As the name of the book is unprecedented, you can order a copy there, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's time to go, so we aren't going to get to questions. But Please come up and answer whatever you like. Thank you, Professor Sanford and Professor Blackman for coming to talk to us about this. Thank if you have any questions, I'll be checking around later. You're welcome to come up. Thank you.